There's a chant that we repeat often. I'm subject to aging. Aging is unavoidable. Subject to illness, subject to death, they're unavoidable. I will grow different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to me. If the reflection stopped there, it would be a reflection for acceptance. This is the way things are. Simply accept that and you'll be okay. And there is that line of thought in a lot of Buddhist circles. That's because we try to fight against these facts that we're miserable. And if we simply accept them, go with the flow, there's no stress in flowing along. But it's still pretty miserable. You're finding happiness by lowering your expectations. Unfortunately, that's not what the Buddha is teaching, because there is that fifth reflection. I'm the owner of my actions. Whatever I do for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. The implication there is that it's through your actions that you can make a difference. Now, in the original Sutta, the Buddha has you go on to think that it's, this applies not only to you, but also to all beings. No matter where you are in the universe, you're subject to aging, illness, death, separation. And you're the owner of your actions. You are responsible for what you do, and you will reap the results of what you do. It's a chastening thought. But as the Buddha said, when you think in those ways, it gets you on the path. Because it's through our actions that we can find an end to aging, illness, and death, and actually go to a dimension that's beyond them. A dimension that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. And it's done through our actions. You see the difference that this thought makes in comparing those two stories of the kings that we often talk about. One is the story of Kornavya, who meets up with a monk, Ratabala, and asks him, Why did you ordain? Here you are, you were wealthy, you had a good family. What would have inspired you to ordain? Radhabella teaches him the four Dhamma summaries. The world is swept away, it does not endure. It offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. It has nothing of its own, one has to pass on, leaving everything behind. Those are the first three summaries. And the king asks him about the meaning of that. And Radhabala draws examples from the king's life. Here he is, 80 years old. He used to have the strength of superhuman strength, he thought. But now he means to put his foot one place and it just goes someplace else. Aging. As for illness, he has a recurring illness. And when it hits, he's debilitated, sh shooting pains throughout his body. And his courtiers are standing around saying, Maybe he's going to go this time. Maybe he's going to go this time. You wonder about the tone of voice with which they're saying that. And as Rantabala points out, there's no way you can ask them to share out some of the pain so that the king feels less pain. He has to feel the pain all on his own. Even though he's king, he can't order his courtiers to do that. As for the third one, even though the king has treasures, he can't take them with him. And the king admits the, the truth of all these statements, but then Rantabala makes his fourth Dharma summary. The world is a slave to craving. Here, the king objects to being called a slave. And Ratabella points out, if someone were to come from the east saying that there is a kingdom to the east that you could conquer with your forces, and has lots of wealth, would you do it? And here the king has just been reflecting on aging, illness, and death, and how he can't take anything with him. And he says, of course I'll go for the, try to conquer that kingdom. How about a kingdom to the south, the west, the north? How about a kingdom on the other side of the ocean? Yes, 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 yes. This is what happens when you simply accept the facts of aging, illness, and death. There comes a point where you can't just accept them anymore. You say, well, what the hell? Might as well try to get what I can while I can. Because a simple fact of impermanence can be interpreted a lot of ways, can be used a lot of ways, one of which is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. Another may be more mouse-like and accepting, but if that's all we're thinking about, then it's simply a matter of personal preference, personal choice. No one can tell anyone else what's right or wrong, or the right, right or wrong way to think about these things. 
But the Buddha points out, it is through our, it is possible that through our actions we can put an end to suffering. And that changes the equation. It's no longer a matter of personal preference. The question is, here this opportunity is there. Are you not going to take it? Otherwise, you just keep coming back to the same old suffering, having to accept the same old suffering. There's another king who got at least an inkling of what the Buddha was talking about. Again, there's an image of east, west, north, south. King Basenity comes to see the Buddha in the middle of the day. And the, but the Buddha asks him, what have you been doing? And the king, remarkably frank, says, oh, I was obsessed with the typical things that those who were obsessed with power are obsessed with. The Buddha asks him, suppose someone were to come from the east and say, there's a huge mountain moving in from the east, crushing all living beings in its path. Another person would come from the south, another from the west, another from the north, all with similar news. There's a mountain moving in from the south, one from the west, one from the north, crushing all living beings in their paths. In the midst of all this destruction and realizing how rare it is to get a human life, what would you do? And the king says, well, what else can I do but skillful practice, dharma practice? That's the one thing that the mountains can't crush, is your karma. And the Buddha says, Okay, I tell you, aging, illness, and death are moving in, crushing all living beings in their way. What are you going to do? The king gives the same answer. What else could I do but skillful actions, dharma actions? It's through our actions that we can make a difference. That's why the Buddha placed such an emphasis on karma. He called himself a gamma wadin, which means someone who teaches action. Because there were people in his day who taught that human beings had no power of action. Either your actions were unreal, or they may be real, but they have no impact. And what's going to happen to you is something totally beyond your control. And even other Gamma Wadins, like the Jains, taught that everything you're going to experience now is a result of past actions, and you have to put up with it. And just learn how not to act. Lie down. Be very still. That way you put up with all the pain, and then at some point the pain will be done when all the bad karma is burned out. But the Buddha taught karma in a different way. Your life is shaped not only by your past actions, but more importantly by your present ones. What you're doing right now, how you're fashioning your experience right now. This is why we meditate. What you're doing right now as you focus on the breath. Direct your thoughts to the breath. Evaluate the breath. Hold certain perceptions of the breath in mind so you can create a feeling of well-being and allow that feeling of well-being to spread through the body. The choices you make as you do that really do change your experience. And they teach you the lessons you're going to need so that you can dig deeper and deeper inside to see how you fabricate your experience. And you get more and more skillful at it, you finally get to the point where there's something unfabricated. And that unfabricated, that's, that's the way out. Something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. So when the Buddha teaches acceptance, it's an acceptance of the fact that there is this problem. We're subject to aging, illness, and death. But there is a solution, and the solution doesn't lie simply in acceptance and sticking, sticking to equanimity. Means learning to become more and more skillful in your actions. There is a potential as you develop the path to find a path that will lead you out. And at that point, the problem is solved. Not because you've lowered your standards, you've actually heightened your standards. And you found something that is totally satisfactory. It is possible. So, which kind of universe would you rather live in? A universe where we stop with the four reflections, or we go on to the fifth. It makes a difference between a universe with no hope and one in which the best hope is possible. It can be attained. It can come true. The Buddha encourages you to go for the second one, and it is the wise choice.